celebrate Women's History Month, um, while also honoring and lifting up voices that, and, and perspectives of Black women in particular, voices that for so many generations have been marginalized or left out entirely, conversations within the academy and even within research library collections like this one. So I want to extend my <clears throat> sincere thanks to the co-coordinators of today's event, Dr. Miriam Intertor and Maureen Wagner from the University Libraries, um, to the uh, faculty and scholars who are joining in today's discussion, Jen Harvey, our events coordinator for uh, managing the events, and to everyone involved in communications and, and work that went into um, uh, today's event. I'm also especially grateful uh, to Miriam for suggesting the recent acquisition of Anna Julia Cooper's book, A uh, Voice from the South by a Black Woman of the South, which I think is a really important volume, not only for the subjects and perspectives that it covers and addresses, but for the diversity of thought and perspectives it brings to our own uh, collections here at the libraries. And by virtue of that, uh, for being available to students, faculty, and community of uh, researchers, whichever it is to come. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. I apologize I won't be able to say it for the entire thing, but I'm really looking forward to it. And it is my pleasure to now introduce Dr. Miriam Vintertor. Thank you, Neil. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Honoring the Legacy of Early Black Women Writers, the Faculty Roundtable. Thanks to all of you joining us here in person, as well as the online. Um, I'm Dr. Miriam Intrishore. I'm member of the librarian here, and I'm thrilled to be introducing today's event and our panel of speakers. Um, before we dive in, just a few logistics for those of you who don't know. Um, restrooms and water are past the elevators and to your left. Um, I'll introduce each of the speakers. Um, they will then each present, and then we'll open up the conversation to questions and answers. Um, there will also be time at the end um, to invite all of you to explore the rare books that we've brought um, along the windows there, um, each of which is relevant to today's topic. Um, you'll be reminded again later, but if you do go look at the books, please plan to leave your belongings at your seat, um, and library staff and students are there to help you, um, help guide you. Um, also, we have to be out of the room by four, so um, we're going to keep to kind of a tight timeline. Um, so now on to the main event. The inspiration for this roundtable, as Neil just mentioned, was our acquisition for the rare book collection of a signed copy of the rare first edition of Anna Julia Cooper's book, A Voice from the South by a Black Woman of the South, which was published in Ohio in 1892, and it is on view in this room. In honor of this truly exciting acquisition and of Women's History Month, in collaboration with Lorraine Wasna, the subject librarian for English, African American Studies, and numerous other departments, we put together this panel. Our intention is to highlight early Black women published authors, their lives, accomplishments, contributions, and legacies. Some of these authors and books have been in the rare book collection since well before my time here. Many, however, are a result of a very intentional collecting policy I've been pursuing with vital support from colleagues like Lorraine um, that seeks to acquire and ensure the preservation and representation of voices, perspectives, experiences, and identities that have for too long been marginalized, if not entirely excluded, from both collecting and from scholarship. Like you, I'm here to learn more about these women, their writings, their impact, and what we have lost and continue to risk losing when we leave so many people out of the historical and academic record. I'll now introduce our panel in the order in which they will speak, beginning with Dr. Theta Gibbs Gray, who is joining us remotely today. Um, turn this back on. Um, Dr. Gibbs Gray is an associate professor of literacy education in the Patton College Department of Teacher Education. With over 21 years of experience in higher education, she is committed to ensuring that classroom spaces are sites of justice and equity while honoring all students' humanity. Through her teaching at the undergraduate and graduate level, she supports pre-service and in-service teachers in creating culturally sustaining, literacy-focused pedagogical practices. She also extends her teaching to pre-college programs where she supports the writing development of first-generation students preparing for college. Her scholarship allows her to lift up the literacies of Black students, honoring their humanity, identity, and history. Dr. Gibbs Gray is also committed to community-based partnerships 
and has created literacy based mentorship for girls of color and family literacy night within local school districts. Through her Spencer funded research, she co created a year long support system for black girls, their parents, teachers, and school administrators to address the adverse effects of inequitable school discipline. She's proud to be from Detroit, Michigan, where she first learned the importance of community. Her parents and family instilled an early love for literacy, which set the foundation for her literacy advocacy. Dr. Uzoma Miller is a visiting professor of African American studies, public historian, and ethnomusicologist. He earned his bachelor's degree in history from Morehouse College, his master's in political science from Jackson State University, and his doctorate in transformative inquiry from the California Institute of Integral Studies. By providing a theoretical basis for experimental, experiential learning as pedagogy, he built on 22 years of innovative higher and secondary education service through interdisciplinary fields and modalities across the Southeast region. He wrote 25 entries in Greenwood Press's Handbook of African American Business, published in 2006, and a well cited monograph, Talented and Revisited in 2011. Miller is set to submit Anatomy of Africana Experiential Pedagogy at a Southeast Ohio University to the Journal of Autoethnography later this spring, which is based on his analysis of integrating primary research on Black history preserved at Ohio University in Athens and within the Southeast Ohio region into his fall 2022 courses and the myriad ways students responded to such stimuli. Dr. Marilyn Judith Atlas, professor of English, specializes in American literature, particularly experimental, ethnic, and literature of place. She is former Women's Studies Director at Ohio University and studies minority and immigrant writers, how race and gender intersect in women's writing, the power of absence in literature, as well as how different art forms influence one another. In 2004, she received the Society for the Study of Midwestern Literature Mid-America Award Quote, for distinguished contributions to the study of Midwestern literature. She has written and lectured extensively on the Chicago Renaissance and Toni Morrison's fiction. She served on editorial boards for the Dictionary of Midwestern Literature, Volumes 1 and 2, and, on, and serves on the editorial boards of Mid-America and Midwestern Miscellaneous. Dr. Mariana L. R. Dantas is an Associate Professor of History and holds a PhD from Johns Hopkins University. She specializes in the history of slavery and African diasporic peoples in the Atlantic world. Her book, Black Townsmen, Urban Slavery and Freedom in the 18th Century Americas, published by Palgrave in 2008, provides a comparative analysis of enslaved and free Blacks as urbanizing agents in the Americas. Her work has been published in various edited volumes in academic journals, including in The Americas, The Journal of Colonialism and Colonial History, The Colonial Latin American Historical Review, the Journal of Family History, African Economic History, and Almanac. She is a recipient of an Arts and Humanities Research Council of the UK grant and a former fellow of the National Humanities Center. She is a founding member and currently serves on the executive board of the Global Urban History Project. Her work on global urban history includes three co-edited special journal issues and the Cambridge Elements book, Early Modern Atlantic Cities, co-authored with Emma Hart, which is forthcoming this year. Her current project investigates families of mixed African and European descent in a colonial Brazilian municipality and their experiences with race formation and social mobility. Finally, Dr. Myrna Perez Sheldon sends her regrets that she is unable to join us today. Please join me in a very warm welcome to all of our panelists. And a reminder, save all your questions for the end. Dr. Gibbs Gray, if you'll go ahead and get us started. Okay, it may not be allowing me to share. Okay. Just a moment. I can share my screen if she wants to tell me when to advance the slides. I'm happy. Okay, yeah, we have your slides here. So if you don't mind just saying next when you want sure. the slides advanced. Um, Thank you. So much. Jen Harvey will save the day. Give us a moment. Thank you, Jen. Okay. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And can you hear me okay? Yes. 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 Okay, perfect. So hello again, everyone. Um, again, my name is Dr. Theta Gibbs Gray, and I'm so honored and delighted to be here. First, thank you to Dr. Intratour and Dr. Wokna. Thank you for both organizing this event and thank you to all of my colleagues, my amazing colleagues who are sitting on this panel today. And thank you to each of you who have taken your time uh, to be in community with us here today. The title of my presentation today is We Were Made to Have a Place, Black Women's Literary Advocacy and Resistance. And I was intentional about the first part um, of this title. So it connects to a work of poetry by one of the women that I will feature today, who is uh, the amazing Frances E.W. Harper. And this book of poetry is called I Was Made to Have a Place. And I thought about the generational legacy uh, that writers like Frances E.W. Harper made, not just for Black women, but for all of us. So I just transposed uh, the, the title, I Was Made to Have a Place, and adjusted it a bit to We Were Made to Have a Place. And I'll talk about the importance of uh, making space and making safe space for Black women and Black women writers. And the two pictures that you see in my presentation, they are intentional pictures. So like many of the women that we will talk about today, they wrote in a time and space where Black women's lives, their words, and even the visual images that, were represent, that represented them were not always positive and they were stereotypical images. So it does my soul some good to find images that show their beauty, uh, how dynamic they are, and are very intentional about how they're represented. So on the left is an illustration of Frances E.W. Harper, and on the right is a picture uh, attached to illustrations of Anna Julia Cooper, who we will also talk about today, and we'll advance to the next slide. Thank you. So there are five key areas, focal areas, that I will briefly touch on today in the time that we have. The first is creating a legacy of Black women provocateurs, sharing pieces of the life of Frances E.W. Harper, honoring Frances E.W. Harper as an early womanist and anti-racist educator, humanizing Black women's emotions and embodiment. So we'll move on to the next slide. In the next slide, if you just take a few seconds to peruse the pictures. So again, the choosing of these pictures is very intentional. Um, the illustrators and the uh, designers of each of the photos were intentional about highlighting the beauty and brilliance, not just the physical beauty, but the spirits of each of the women who are here. And so I'll continue in terms of this idea of placemaking for Black women. And I thought about this idea of writing to prepare a place for you. So this also connects to if many of you saw the recent film that focused on Harriet Tubman, uh, Cynthia Erivo sings a very powerful song that uh, it, it, it connects to a biblical uh, thought and concept of I go to prepare a place for you. And so I also thought about this title and transpose it again to I write to prepare a place for you, that each of the women that we talk about today, they were intentional about not only writing themselves into history, but writing themselves into history so that Black women would not be forgotten mm -hmm. and would be humanized in ways that we have not been. So the writers that we're talking about today, they created a, a continuing legacy of Black women provocateurs. And what I mean by provocateurs are women who write, not just to write, but to write for social change. They write in critical ways that make us each think, regardless of our positionality and our identity. Their writing is meant to result in some type of positive movement. And in that way, they are amazing provocateurs. So at the bottom, you'll see Toni Morrison. You'll also see Bell Hooks at the top you will see Sonia Sanchez, and next to her, Monique Morris, Zora Neale Hurston, and Shirley Chisholm. 
all women who in different ways utilize their writing for academic purposes, for public writing, for lecturing, uh, for political reasons that have essentially continued to write the importance of black women's lives inside of each of their platforms. And we'll go to the next slide here. So specifically for the rest of the presentation, for the remainder of, there should be about uh, three more slides that we'll focus on. I will specifically focus on the dynamic life of Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. And again, by no means um, are the facts that I'm sharing with, with you complete facts of her life. There's so much that is left out here and that I'm hoping that each of us will follow up and do our own diligence and do research. So I was really excited to build upon what I already knew and engage upon research. And I learned so much more than I already did and am continuing to uh, be excited about searching for more information. So first, it's always important how we situate Black women. Um, and so it's important for me to say that she is a worthy Black woman. Woman, Starting from an asset-based perspective is very important for a number of different reasons. She was an abolitionist, an early women's rights advocate for all women, and she was an early womanist. So the difference here is that in addition to her advocating for all women's rights, she specifically advocated for the rights of Black women. And she appealed to the masses to remind them that if, if no woman is free, that Black women are not free as well. So we'll talk about uh, the, the collective nature of what she wrote about and appealing to our moral and, and human senses. She was born a free woman in 1825. And she was born in, in a state that was still a slave holding state. So to think about uh, the context in which she lived, where she, where she was able to move about as a free woman, but not in all cases, she still had to be careful. So there were certain parts of the state that she could not enter into, which led her to not come back to her state for many years in fear of being captured, although she was a free woman. At 13, she became a seamstress and a nursemaid to a white family that owned a bookstore. And her passion for books grew within the shop. She later lived with abolitionists William and Letitia George Steele, and much of her writing transitioned to uh, writing that uh, advocated for the abolition uh, of slavery. So as we know, for the next 40 years of her life, was still very active. And we'll move to the next slide here. So as we think about her as a womanist and anti-racist uh, and her anti-racist advocacy, what I think about is that often in dominant society, we don't often name uh, scholars and abolitionists and writers like, like Frances Harper. So we do, we're able to name uh, amazing women, black women like bell hooks, right? And, and other women who are, and Toni Morrison, um, and Alice Walker um, and, and Angela Davis, who are womanists and who argue for the importance of making sure that women of color and Black women are inserted in feminism. So here it's really important for us to think about how, as an early writer, she was also an early womanist. And if we look at uh, and, and an early anti-racist advocate. So if we look to the left, her quote says, I know that no nation can gain its full measure of enlightenment and happiness if one half of it is free and the other half is fettered. So here she is talking about what is happening in terms of the bondage that was still existing um, that, that maintained an oppressive and horrible system of slavery that impacted uh, African-American humans. And here she's again appealing and saying, we can't think about our own enlightenment. We cannot be enlightened unless all of us are enlightened. And similarly, in the second quote, she says, we are all bound up together in one great bundle of humanity and society cannot trample on the weakest and feeblest of its members without receiving the curse in its own soul. So here again, she's appealing to morality 
And she's saying, it's not only that we're connected to each other, it's that we have to understand that it serves no one. And in fact, that it is a curse on our society to maintain systems such as slavery and domination based on race or sex or any part of our identity. So what I thought about as I was reading through and just studying these words, it connected to an interview. And I think that many of you may have seen this interview uh, that focuses on the author, Toni Morrison. And originally, uh, Bill Moyers interviewed Toni Morrison. And he asked a question to her and said, you know, when will you start writing about white people? Why are you so focused on focus on on centering black women in the black experience? At what point will, will it change? And at multiple points in her life, many journalists asked her variations of the same question. They asked her to justify why she was centering her writing on black women and the black experience. So I was really intrigued by her response and how much it connects to many of the words of Frances Harper. Toni Morrison basically says the people who practice racism are bereft. There is something distorted about the psyche. When you take it away, what are you without racism? It's wasteful, it's ugly, and it doesn't serve any of us. So in the same way, Frances Harper has given permission to writers like Toni Morrison to ensure that they're reminding us of the collective nature of our humanity and that although uh, power and privilege seem to uh, seem to be a benefit to some of us, that is actually not when we think about what it's doing to our souls and the inner fibers of our being. And we'll move to the next slide. So here, uh, Frances Harper also focused on humanizing Black women's lives. So she wanted to make sure that we didn't continue experiencing dehumanization. And this is something that, that Black women still experience. So if you're, if you're familiar with Black women often being positioned as angry, as aggressive, simply when we share basic emotions, that we know that anger is a basic human emotion, but in dominant society, often when Black women display their anger and they're not causing harm to anyone else, they are still structured as aggressive. In another way, our humanity is stripped away by making it seem like we don't experience pain. And this is, you know, this is also um, a major issue when we think about uh, the health and health implications for Black women that long ago it was thought that because Black women didn't endure pain or could endure significant amounts of pain, that we were not given pain medication or our safety and our care was something that wasn't thought about when pain uh, was something that was a part of our life. So in this particular poem, it's called Aunt Chloe. Um, and, and I will let you know that it does focus on a woman who is enslaved and she is experiencing her children being taken away. Part of the excerpt goes this way. I remember, well remember, that dark and dreadful day when they whispered to me, Chloe, your children's sold away. It seemed as if a bullet had shot me through and through, and I felt as if my heartstrings was breaking right in two. So here she is intentionally letting us know that it is extremely important to think about the humanity and what it is like to be stripped away from your children and to watch this experience and to have no agency and to be able to do nothing. So here she is saying, please let us think about emotionally what this is doing to black women's souls and what is it doing to our souls to be able to continue to advocate for such a system as slavery to exist. And we'll move to the next slide. So as we think about you know, what this means for us moving forward, it's important for us to embody early Black women writers' impact on our lives. So talking about it in this space is very important. Being able to actually touch and read the books that our colleagues have so thoughtfully uh, allowed a space to exist at OU is really important. But this work is ongoing work, right? It, it is work of our souls. It is work of us remembering our individual humanity and each other's. 
So it's important that we remember as black women, we are worthy witnesses. So for your black women colleagues, for your black women students and family members to remember that we are worthy, our feelings and our experiences are worthy. And what does it look like to hold space to affirm our experiences as opposed to denying them or explaining them away. For black women to, to remember that we possess a long literary ancestral lineage and that this also helps us to engage in ancestral healing. When we think about the pain that black women have experienced, including the writers that we experience today, while they experience joy, there is a space and time for us to think about how can we in the living in the now practice healing back to those generations that experienced so much? How do we counter the erasure and invisibility of US history? You know, what our colleagues in the library have done have made sure that part of US history, black history and Ohio history, because there are many rich Ohio connections are uplifted. How can we engage in critical introspection so for ourselves, even if we don't identify as black women, how do the themes explored impact us personally and collectively? Because they do. They do inside our classrooms, inside of our colleges, inside Athens and all the communities in which we live and exist. And as a campus community, how do we commit to learn more about black women's experiences, women's rights, history and abolitionist history? Because this, again, is a space that is rich with so much that is valuable for each of us to know. So I thank you. And before I end, I also, again, as I'm thankful to Dr. Intratore and Dr. Wokna, I also want to acknowledge one of our colleagues who is not with us today, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Bayina Jeffries, who is a former department chair at OU and a, a dear colleague and friend who was one of the first people at OU who helped me to understand the importance of integrating rare books that focus on many of us who have been marginalized. So again, collectively, thank you so much for this opportunity. And I look forward to hearing from um, our additional colleagues. Thank you. I'll be focusing my comments on Angela's uh, uh, is being featured today. Uh, 1892's Voices of the South, excuse me, Voices of the South by a Black Woman of the South. Um, so briefly, um, with training in the discipline of history, uh, my orientation is always to start with context, so brief context. Uh, Angela Cooper, the speaker, author, educator, a transformative pedagogue or teacher, community advocate, and racial and gender champion. I'll start with the familiar context to set the tone. Um, as Katrin Gines notes, she presumed that her father was her mother's master, adding that her mother was always too modest and shamefaced ever to mention her. With this one sentence, Cooper can have to vote the plight of enslaved Black women of that time being untutored and sexually exploited, as well as a significant triumph learning to read and write against all odds. Uh, so this is the backdrop in which Cooper is born in 1858 in Raleigh, North Carolina. Her early uh, educational training is what we will now refer to as historically black college university. St. Augustine's, although at that time, uh, post slavery. They were now what we think of as universities now. Again, just think of the logic, uh, upwards of 8% of the population of African Americans at that time functionally literate. So just like everyone in this room, before you can learn college education, you have to learn primary and secondary education. 
Um, the HBCU correlation is significant. Um, she also developed very early on the age 10, 11, 12 adolescents, um, a penchant for agitation with the cause of equality of humanity by way of her lens as a black Mormon. Specifically, as early as uh, before she completes her studies and ends up up the road in Oberlin, where she will get her master's and her bachelor's in mathematics. But she studies the classics and classics in the context of classics. Um, think of um, classics in the context of what's referenced Western European. Um, rightly, wrongly, indifferent, but I'm going to come to that point, which is one of my major points that I want to suggest that um, as with everything she did, it was intentional. So even the use of the, of the classics, it was not as an ivory tower intellectual looking down upon the lesser fortunate. To the contrary, her orientation throughout the deeds of her life indicate the opposite, that her orientation was the bottom up. Whereas we are celebrating uplifting her now, the reality is that during her time, she was ostracized on every level and every front. Yet and still, as we educators try to impart on our students, impact cannot be taken away. And impact comes in many forms. So uh, in the interest of time, let me uh, pick it up a little bit. Um, but she focuses, and her training is in the classics. Um, even at St. Augustine's normal school, um, there's substantial evidence of her being one of the, the main cogs in appealing to the patriarchal teachings of only the boys learning the classics. Um, this will continue at Oberlin. Um, she is one of the early uh, forerunners and progenitors of, again, uh, bringing attention to the inequality uh, for women. And one uh, quote that stands out, um, oh, excuse me. Uh, so she leaves St. Augustine, goes to Oberlin, completes her bachelor's, and uh, 1884 and her master's in 1887. Um, the preeminent work, though it's important to note, this is not her, it's her most recognized work, but like many people, particularly when you are marginalized, um, works don't always constitute a published book. Right? So another part of the lens that I bring and bring to the table is that they're public historian and former archivist. So working with records, and documents as tools to build and reconstruct history. So when we bring those uh, into consideration, there are uh, numerous examples of, of her types of work. Nonetheless, the most uh, celebrated Voice of the South, 1892, uh, this text reconceptualizes the dominant tenets of civility or the idea of civility, freedom and equality, implements musical metaphor, applies sarcasm, and it compels readers to radically evaluate the ways in which we recognize social change. To the focus of my talk, the language Pan-African may not come up uh, through many searches in association with her name. Uh, I'm going to point out four examples of where I feel this can be seen. And pan Africanism, as with many, as with all philosophies, is not uh, one size fits all, the different manifestation, implicit, explicit. Um, but the first example, um, Olivia Heron, who is a, a famed African American classicist, um, Jewish author, educator, and publisher. But she credits Cooper with helping her in her own mind, referring to Heron. Locate the potency and agency of Black epics. Epics in the context of the epics we learn in the European classical canon. But Heron does not associate this with something that was explicitly taught to her by Cooper. The link is growing up in Washington, D.C., the imprint of Cooper as a pedagogue, a teacher for over 30 years is absolutely undeniable in Washington, D.C. And Heron um, graduated from the school 
and her mother graduated from the school, Douglas High School, which at the time was called M Street, which would be Colored High School. Um, but the point is, as a pedagogue, Cooper was also um, early, one of the early practitioners performance of, if you will, Socratic method, et cetera. But this idea that learning is more than the memorization, the rote memorization of facts, names, dates, et cetera, but instead, uh, transformative education is centered upon engagement where you're uh, motivating and putting students in a position to engage with ideas, content, uh, establishing their own philosophy based on what they have been exposed to. But how Heron makes this connection with Cooper is that she is in the archives where she has a fellowship um, and she's doing research, but the connection is she associates when she was learning about Cooper from reading Voices of the South, this idea and the spirit of not just accepting what the mainstream presents to you. So specifically, odd as this may sound, and I would suggest it's still prevalent for the masses of us in the room and otherwise, the notion of an African-derived hero, Shiro, is not as prevalent as we may think. So, Heron, in her uh, research, and again, she's crediting the inspiration for this, but she comes across a work called The Harp of Ethiopia in 1914 by Maurice Corvette, while quote unquote stumbling across miscellaneous material. Um, again, in the interest of time, as there are many students in, in here, uh, remember research, the prefix means re, which means again, and again, and again. You cannot find and probably will not find the golden nugget without due diligence. And you can find many things in miscellaneous corners. <laughs> um, secondly, there is a biblical uh, reference, uh, Simon of Cyrene. Cyrene is in Libya, Northern Africa. But one of Cooper's writings use metaphorical language to essentially present a non-binary conceptualization of man and woman, but the, the, the connection that she's making is, and I'll read a quote, using uh, Simon of Cyrene. This quote, um, excuse me. Yes, this quote comes from uh, uh, Shirley Moody Turney. And it says, in Simon of Cyrene, Quote, one elect throughout the ages to play his part in the drama when Asia betrayed and Europe crucified Africa, predestined to come forward humbly, gladly to give service. The peculiar contribution of Ethiopia's blameless prince, end quote. Again, what I'm suggesting here is not that Anna Julia Cooper is... Um, a Garveyite, right? uh, pan Africanist in the tradition of Marcus Messiah Garvey. To me, that does not matter. The reads of African consciousness and positive imagery of a Black ideal is equally significant in my lens. Next example, in 1923, while she is a teacher at M Street, which at a later point she will become principal of, we don't have the time to get into, but the record clearly shows while she was the principal, not just as a black principal, not just as a woman principal, but as an educator. She was producing black scholars that went off to the best institutions in the country, PWI, as well as historically black. Nonetheless, uh, interesting tidbit, she produces a, uh, she has a student produce a play in 1923, which centralizes, quote, excuse me, African contributions to humanity through the production of the Onion a Latin epic poem written by Virgil between 29 and 19 BC. Again, the intentionality, right? Again, this is one aspect that I'm focusing on, the numerous aspects that we focused on. Um, but I'm bringing what I see as um, often not the obvious or the most tangible, but we still find these threads. Another quick point to, uh, to show and indicate the gender inequality, to say it mildly, is even African-American patriarchy by her colleagues of the time, many of whom 
we revere, and I would suggest rightfully so, but we can still be critical, right? Of gentlemen such as W.E.B. Du Bois, Eileen Locke, Carter G. Woodson, Charles S. Johnson, Charles Wesley, and in fact, and indeed Booker T. Washington. The point is, Anna Julia Cooper, amongst many things, was a philosopher, not a woman philosopher, not a black philosopher, even though she those things too. Her record, her scholarship, though she was ostracized and marginalized, when you read her colleague that cite her, reference her, she was very much part of the conversation. Um, lastly, her dissertation. When she completed her mid-60s from the Sorbonne in France, she started her dissertation earlier at Columbia, but to cut to the chase, I can wrap it up. The title of her dissertation in English, France's Attitude Towards Slavery During the French and Haitian Revolution. This is 1925 by African American woman. Defended in French in France. Whereas this is cows from information now, that in and of itself is a statement. Nonetheless, it wasn't just ceremonial. This work parallels Du Bois's dissertation, The Suppression of the African Slave Trade in the United States of America, 1863 to 1870. It expands how one reads text and intentionally grounds through a process of grappling with the interrelationship between the colonized and the colonizer. It also speaks to the complexity, again, complexity, not simplistically, of socioeconomic dynamics related to the body politic. She addresses the morality of the enslaved. She addresses the underdevelopment of Africa, which foreshadows Walter Rodney's how Europe underdeveloped Africa in 1972. There also, also are parallels with France Fanon's Black Skin, White Mask, 1952. Not so much from the lens of what they are arguing, but I use this as a reference because France Fanon was French, uh, uh, originates from uh, Martinique, French colonized Martinique. He was a student in Paris and he was a medical doctor in Algeria. So the application of some of the extensions of what Cooper is talking about in her dissertation, right? The complex racial class hierarchy that emerges in France and in Haiti. Influenced organizations of the abolitionist causes. Specifically, she looks at uh, the society of the friends of the blacks and how this entity will become a partner, if you will, of the Jacobins. Lastly, uh, on this point, Presently, the Caribbean Philosophical Association's best paper presented by a beginning scholar at their previous year's international conference is named in Anna Julia Cooper's honor. And I'll close there. My thanks to the library. My thanks to Mary Turner, to Lorraine Wachner, whose name I better not be mispronouncing, who helped us get to this moment of artifacts. And artifacts matter. Um, it was just an article on uh, by Deborah Lipschitz, um, because uh, there had been some uh, discussion about whether you should wear gloves when you're looking at rare books. And Lipschitz added to the conversation that she had held a Haggadah, her old one, and that it was stained with wine because the Haggadah is the book that's used during Passover services. It tells the retelling of the freedom um, getting out of Egypt. It was stained in wine. And she said, how, how more precious was it? that it was an artifact that had been touched. That the worst thing to do to a book is not to stain it respectfully, to be there, to add your DNA to the reading, to the real reading, because the requirement is to read the whole book, to the real reading of the book. That books were very, very complex artifacts. They told the history of a certain time and a certain place and a certain person. 
are from a certain family background, etc. And it was it's really important to note where that book comes from and how it has legs and what it could have been had there been other books. And I guess that's the center of my few minutes of remarks. Is first of all, you should know. I'm very thankful that this book exists in our library. So you can go and look at a first edition, the real deal. But Henry Louis Gates, who seems to be there at the right, right moment, so on, <laughs> has through Penguin given us the portable Anna Julia Cooper. Not, you know, 2022, you can all get it. Max $20 cheaper if you do something terrible like supporting Amazon. <laughs> Regardless, it exists and it helps because it contextualizes. And I'm all for context. But as my poor students know, I'm all for reading the text slowly and carefully because real honor doesn't come from pretending someone was perfect. But real honor comes from seeing what they said, who they were. I think it's really, really important. And that does change uh, what you think about them, for better and for, for, for worse. We're lucky, we're living in a time that's not either or, that's not so black and white. But you can be hybrid, we're intersectional. We know that depending on what you're identifying with in a certain day, that's going to change how you look at something and what you do. We know that. And I don't want to idealize Cooper, who doesn't need my idealization. She's amazing. She's wonderful. She's the fourth PhD of a Black woman in America. And she doesn't need my permission. But I do want to take a look at who she might have been in a different world, how her writing, those essays, because this is a book of essays that she wrote when she was third, she published at 36. She wrote earlier where she had the nerve to take on William Dean Howells. And he had written a book. Um, I'll give you the name of it because she absolutely hated it. She, <laughs> thought, she thought, can you be more stupid? Um, an imperative duty where he centered his book on a woman who, my colleague Paul Jones knows the book probably, a woman who was 15, 16, white, but had the compulsion to help her people. <laughs> and she said, oh, gag me with a spoon if that expression had been used. Give me a break. This is one 16th day, uh, you know, black. I know you probably didn't mean harm, but don't write about my people in this way because it raises my blood pressure. That was basically her. It's an, it's an, you can read it. It's in an essay. It's really a wonderful, wonderful essay. And of course, this was pretty early in William Dean Howe's fictional career. He's a great writer in many, many ways. And he was never good with African Americans. <laughs> the rise of Silas Lapham, he's got two walking his ghost. He can't get into what they do or who they are or how they fit in to this uh, book about the rising working class. But she, it was published in 91. This was published in 92. It must have been one of the later essays, though it's a middle one. And um, I can give you the name of the essay that that is in. Um, one Face of American Literature, it's a sentence out of the, the nine, nine essays that's near the end. But what she also does, and again, <laughs> the, the context is complicated, if she really honors Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, because she likes that depiction of African Americans. She is living in a time, as, as is Booker T. Washington, where not getting people lynched is a really good thing. She doesn't want to rock the boat. It's the cult of true womanhood. Women aren't supposed to be sexual. She doesn't deal with the whole nine yards of what it means to be an embodied human, nor can she, nor can she consciously. It's too much to ask of a person. She's, she's up against enough. And I just want to read you one letter that she wrote. 
because not because it's central, but because it's telling, if that, if that makes sense to you, because it gives us an insight of what pushed her buttons. And let me see if I can find that for you very, very quickly. Um, it's 279 of this um, easy to use. <laughs> it doesn't require archival work, thank God, for just a minute. There's plenty else to do, I'm sure. Um, but I just, it's very short. I just want to put you look at it. For here. Editor of the Tribune. I think it is a pity that the high note of your editorial page should be vitiated by a selection that presents the very opposite ideal from the one you so ably advocate. That so seriously minded a paper as the Tribune, which condemns Amos and Andy as pernicious propaganda and a vicious caricature of the race should allow Midnight Nan to strut and wiggle through the same page where on we find earnest advice from children's reading. Most surely have been an oversight. A full survey of Langston Hughes poetry ought to furnish, I am sure, some sample of his genius more in keeping with the high standard announced by the Tribune than this nauseating portrait of a color prostitute. My criticism is not against Hughes for writing about whatever he sees and happens to know, but I do object to pictures of the gutter and sewer being called and paraded by preference from all the ennobling and inspiring examples of art that present themselves to examples that are just as true to life just as humanly appealing and just as artistically acceptable. Walt Whitman did much that was coarse and vulgar in his poetic creations. When one has to wade through his unexpurgated works to find it, not so much. <laughs> you will not be confronted with the filth of leaves of grass on the editorial pages of a cosmopolitan newspaper. And this is not for more race squeamishness either, but a mere matter of literary taste and fine selection according to the eternal fitness. Of well, we know this eternal fitness of things is framed within a very middle class world that leaves marginal people extremely marginalized. And this is, remember, early in her career. And I've not read all her work. But these essays, these texts, while they are wonderful in so many ways, she's totally for education. She takes Southern women to task for well, sisterhood, not there. Um, the title of her, of her essay shows her desire for education and her writing shows her artistry. She, she divides in one essay writers between kind of preachers, which she includes Milton, interestingly enough, and artists who are much more into aesthetics for aesthetics. And I think while she tends to see herself as a preacher, she in within that framework, she also was an artist. These are really, really powerful, well written essays. Um, and she's a philosopher. And like all humans, she gets to change her mind from the age of 36. Thank God. Otherwise, we would all be injected to Trump and steps over before 20. <laughs> you still have to get there to get over it. Um, but I just wanted to mention some of some of that stuff. To me, she represents through her silences kind of the Adrian Rich, a thinking woman sleeps with monsters. There are things she cannot even say to herself. And I wonder, and I'll end with this comment, I wonder what her thinking would have been like had she been able to read here, um, Henry Louis Gates discovered this in 2005, Our Nick, 
an African American kind of autobiography novel whose central character was a trickster. Not available to her. Never mentioned in any of these essays. I read the essays waiting for a comment on that text and on incidents of the life of a slave girl. She knew nothing about that text. Nothing. Nothing about <laughs> Harriet Beecher Stowe's two children that she chose to have with a lawyer slash member of the House of Representatives to avoid the continual onslaught of a, a man she named uh, Dr. Flint. She was writing during the time where black people were still, it was pre-Civil War. And she changed her name to Linda Brent and the people that she knew. But that book through Linda Brent, and it is autobiographical, comparatively allows for female sexuality. Linda Brent had two children before she was 20. She screams up and notes that screaming is the wrong word. She says repeatedly she was not raped. But she also mentions that 11, something like, I, I think the number is 11, a lot of children were the children of Dr. Flint. Why would she have not been raped? What would have kept her from being raped? Other than she was afraid, had she said that, it would have diminished her in the eyes of a world that saw women as sullied once they had been touched. You could you 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 could not not be the responsible for your own abuse during that era or made less by it. Um, it's, it's such an interesting text, and I wonder had it been available, had we not lost it. Um, uh, Lydia Maria Child framed it by saying, hey, this woman's real, she can write, she can teach, this is her book. But then it got lost. And by the time this, 19, this 1892 work was written by Cooper, it wasn't available to me. So she did it not without role models, but she did it through a limited lens, a lens that would have not been there had we had libraries like ours collecting books that were major. And I love the internet in terms of research. I'm not so good at it, but I, I love doing research on it. But we need the real deal. We need the real books. And I so appreciate our spending the money and the time and the energy to get those books. And I have three more. I could talk for a few hours, but I won't. for um, giving us this treasure, treasure stone, right, of, uh, 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 of rare books uh, in our library. It's a real privilege to have access to that. And I hope everybody will set up an appointment and go and, and look at these books and, and work with them. Um, when Miriam invited me to participate in this panel, right, uh, as a, a historian of the African diaspora in the Americas, so I do comparative work with um, Brazil and the United States, and I think about you know, the, the diaspora throughout all of the Americas. Uh, I thought I would talk about um, the uh, the lost intellectual contribution of Africans and their descendants to our Western uh, culture, and what historians of the African diaspora point out to be um, uh, a lack of recognition uh, that African descendants um, should have an intellectual history. Usually, right, when you studied uh, the history of Africans and their descendants in the, in the U.S., in, in the Americas, right, it's through the lens of uh, slavery and abolition, social problems, right, their economic contribution. There's not a recognition of their intellectual input. Um, 
And people have been rallying against that and trying to point out uh, the ways in which, in fact, they are part of our intellectual tradition. Um, and but then I'm still going to talk a little bit about that. But then something right happened last week that make make me feel that this discussion in light of these books and Anne and Julia Cooper in particular uh, makes it really important to address, uh, which was the introduction of the Ohio Senate Bill 83. Right, the Ohio Higher Higher Education Bill uh, in the Senate. So this is still being discussed. It hasn't been passed. Uh, some of you might be aware of this bill. Uh, it follows the trend set by other state bills that aim to regulate aspects of higher education. Um, so it proposes uh, to change ways that state universities operate and how faculty can teach. Uh, but one of the things that it proposes is to make it a requirement that all students in uh, Ohio State universities have to take an American history course and or an American government course. And you might think, well, that, let's say that that's not a real problem, right? We live in the United States, why not? Uh, but the way they're framing it is also they are requiring these courses to teach key texts, right? So they're dictating what texts we have to learn, what texts we have to teach students. And by the way, they want all students to take a cumulative exam at the end of the semester, which is something I never do. So, uh, uh, where you students would be tested on these texts, and the and the text, the list that, that the bill proposes are the entire Constitution of the United States, the entire Declaration of Independence, a minimum of five essays of the Federalist Papers, the entire Emancipation Proclamation, the Gettysburg Address. And then Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, letter from Birmingham Jail. So one concession to one one African American uh, figure, right, in our in our intellectual cultural tradition. Uh, so I would ask, right, does it seem that there are any voices missing from this particular? <laughs> you know, maybe Native Americans, maybe women, maybe Black people, right, and in particular Black women. Um, and okay, to be sure, right, the list does not mean other texts not be taught, just that these have to be taught, right? But I would argue, one, that these lists, when they're proposed uh, and when they're taken seriously, they do have this problematic impact of setting a certain standard of what is relevant. And by that standard, right, de uh, defining what might be irrelevant, right, which, which is problematic. Uh, two, I would also say that, you know, I teach U.S. history up until uh, uh, Reconstruction. Um, we all teach these documents, right? We teach their content, but we don't necessarily force students to read these texts, right? Because it's often more important to help students understand, understand the context in which these texts were produced, right? Um, and um, usually we do so through other texts. Right, that we have students read. Um, and so the context is the intellectual ideas, the social, political, economic issues, and often the contentious debate that informed the production of these uh, documents, right? And that's what we want students to understand. We want them to examine it, right? We want them to engage with these texts critically. And so when we do that, there's so much more room for introducing different voices, right? There's a need, in fact, to, uh, to uh, introduce different voices so that we can understand the types of uh, uh, discussions, right, and confrontations and, and consensus that went into shaping uh, the, the trajectory of the United States. Now, we know that these legislative efforts, right, to regulate higher education, are premised in this misguided politicization of academic conference parts in schools and universities. And, you know, to pull it, put it really bluntly, the concern that some express is that this critical engagement with the history, the culture, the literature, and current events of the United States would undermine patriotism, right? And would, under, would undermine white pride. Um, and this misguided politicization had some people arguing that then the state and local governments should dictate what the academic content is. Uh, and the danger here then is, as I said before, not so much what would be demanded of students, but what would be excluded, right? What you would lose access to. 
the idea that there could be an ideological, uh, an ide ideologically neutral canon, right, of like necessary texts, is a fallacy, right? There's no canon that is not ideologically informed, and we sh we can decide there's a canon, but we also have to examine why these particular texts were, were chosen. We have to engage with them um, critically, right? Um, and we have to, uh, but we have to make sure that in those choices, we don't ignore other people. And this is what these works that are exposed here remind us of, right? That uh, when we do that, right? When we ignore other voices, when we fail to appreciate uh, other work, there's a lot that we lose. Um, and Phyllis, so I'm going to reference here Phyllis Weekly, Harriet Jacobs, Francis Harper that my colleague talked about earlier, Anna Julia Cooper, which I'll, I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, they did face this uh, exclusionary environment during their lifetime, right? That minimizing the relevance of uh, their work, and particularly as Dr. Miller pointed out, right, undermined the fact that they were speaking to a broader society. They were speaking to broader intellectual pursuits, not just, you know, for a small community of educated uh, Black people. Uh, and as a result of being excluded that way. Um, the legacy of their intellectual contributions have been um, unrecognized, right? And more recently, there has been attempts to recover that. Um, and uh, Julia Cooper's dissertation was translated you know, like 20 years ago, right? Published and translated only 20 years ago. So people have been uh, trying to recover this work uh, and we're so lucky we have access to them here. But this has not been uh, uh, an easy trajectory. And often this type, their work, right, can still be pigeonholed into like very niche, right, <laughs> historical and literary uh, spaces, right? Uh, um, Harriet Jacobs' work is usually uh, uh, published along other uh, slave narrative works, whereas, you know, it is a work about human rights, about women's rights, about uh, the experience of motherhood, it's so rich, right? But a lot of these works end up being taught and consumed in these very niche ways uh, that again deny uh, these women the ability to talk to a much broader audience and to, to uh, uh, deny them the recognition that they're participating in much broader debates, right? And just to give you a little taste of the uphill battle that they faced, during their lifetime, I, I do want to go back to Thomas Jefferson, right, that icon of <laughs> American everything. Um, in his notes on the state of Virginia, if, uh, if, if you guys have read it, right, he makes these comments about uh, Black people and their place in America, right? And he's very explicit in saying that all the ways in which they're inferior to white people. And he particularly says that they're inferior in reason, right? So. Uh, he says that there, I, I, and I quote here, as I, uh, I think one could scarcely be found capable of tracing and comprehending the investigations of Euclid. Well, here's Anna Judith. You're probably wrong. She's perfectly capable of all of engaging with, you know, um, the, the ancient thinkers. Um, he also accuses them of, ha of not having any imagination or imagination that is dull, tasteless, and anom anomalous. Uh, he says that, and I quote, never yet could I find that a Black had uttered a thought above the level of plain narration. Uh, and he says, says that they're incapable of poetry. Uh, and speaking of Phyllis Wheatley, right, he, and I quote, says, the compositions published under her name, maybe the station's the author, <laughs> right, published under her name are below the dignity of criticism. Right, so this is Jefferson in 1783, and those ideas of uh, African Americans' uh, unsuitability, unsuitability or incapability of um, intellectual pursuits gaining space in, in the national imagination, right? And they persisted throughout the 19th century and into the early to mid uh, 20th century, leaving a very um, lasting harmful effect. Right in the way we think about intellect, American uh, intellectual history and who belongs there, right? To refer back to my colleagues' idea of making a place, right? And who has a place. Um, 
And yet, you know, these ideas were so much part of those debates, debates about how, how government would evolve. What is the meaning of freedom? What should be the role of education and labor in the development of our society? And how society should occupy itself with the well-being and advancement of Black people and Black women in particular. So now getting back to Anna Julia Cooper's, uh, Anna Julia Cooper's work um, uh, and the essays that are in the, this book that we just acquire, um, she makes so many important contributions that when you read it, you think, if only, if only these ideas had been part of the debate at the time, where could we have been? You know, how things could have gone. So, for instance, right in this essay entitled Womanhood, a Vital Element in the Regeneration and Progress of the Race, um, she celebrates the future promise of American institutions, um, but notes that elevation um, uh, uh, that the elevation of the status of African Americans in this country still dealing with the legacy of slavery would only be complete when Black women can experience their womanhood without violence and independent of male patronage, right? Uh, so she's contributing a powerful idea about, you know, how our society has to uh, incorporate, right, everybody and care for everybody for its advancement. Um, in The Higher Education of Women, which is another essay, she argues that women should not be required to diminish themselves to satisfy the, the demands of men, right? Because there was this idea that if women became too educated, they would just become unpleasant for men, <laughs> right? So she argues that that should not be our pursuit. Instead, right, women should be allowed to advance themselves through education to then encourage men to improve themselves so that they may, may be worthy of women and therefore all society can become better, right? I think all the women in the room can relate to that. You know, I appreciate this idea, uh, right? And wouldn't we, wouldn't have we benefited so much from having these ideas part of the debate at the time, right? In another essay uh, entitled, Has America a Race Problem? If so, how can it be solved? She makes a convincing argument for diversity and inclusion 150 years before we were even talking about this, right? And she states that, and I quote, the community that closes its gates against foreign talent can never hope to advance beyond a certain point. Resolve to keep on out foreigners and you keep out progress. She then recasts the idea of problem Right, to argue that the black presence in the United States, um, you know, is not so, so much problematic as it is, and I quote, a guarantee of the perpetuity and progress of America's institutions. Because she argues very convincingly in this essay that diversity promotes healthy debate and prevents stagnation. <laughs> um, and then she calls everyone to quote, for the love of humanity. Stop the mouth of those learned theorizers, the expedient mongers. Don't let them argue as if there were no part to be played in life by Black men and Black women, and as if to become white were the universal solvent for all America's irritations. Finally, in the essay, What We Are Worth, uh, she examines the question of the relevance of Black people to the U.S. And she borrowed very, uh, she does this very well, borrowing from economic principles uh, and through a discussion about the investment society makes in people and what it gains in return, right? So this economy of, of uh, generating capital, right? Spending capital and generating capital. Um, she then lists the, con the crucial contributions of Black people's labor, but also uh, various inventions and intellectual and artistic production. And, um, she basically says the capital invested in this population has been minimal and the return has been gigantic, right? So, and she challenges then American and its institutions to recognize what they have received from Black people by then investing more in Black men and women. And again, right, how beneficial, how even like revolutionary would it have been if the late 19th century and early 20th century had paid greater attention to Cooper's ideas about diversity and social inclusion. So 
as I, as I said in the beginning, historians of the African diaspora has, have for some years now emphasized this need to recognize the intellectual contributions of Africans and their descendants to the development and tra trajectory of our country, but also of our Western world. These works uh, exhibited here today, uh, and Julia Cooper's writing, remind us that we still need to do that better and that we need to reject any political attempt to limit Again, right, what was being done in the 19th century is kind of being done, trying, right, there's an attempt to do it again today. So we have to reject any political attempts to limit what should be considered the canon. Doing so, limiting the canon means risking missing out on the richness of these arguments and their ability to push our public debate in promising directions. Um, I am curious about how these works were published at such an early, you know, time in the world, you know, mm -hmm. that's like my main question. Thank you. I, I actually don't, don't know, I just know that it was, but that's a very good research question to find, to find out exactly how it was. I suspect you were pretty darn well connected. Um, at a very young age, that she was a brilliant student, and that she had mentors um, who were pushing her. Um, you know, we had gone through in American literature the 1830s and 1860s, a woman like Margaret Fuller, who were writing essays like Man versus Men, Woman versus Women, and also in her um, 1843 text, had discussed as does Cooper. Um, the role of Native American in all, which is a big part of um, the early thinking of um, Anna Julia Cooper. So, and she was definitely a, a world leader. We know something about that, which is demonstrated. She was a woman, not just of America, but who knew languages. Um, but I don't know exactly the trajectory. I mean, someone at Oberlin. She couldn't finish her PhD at Columbia. She went to the Sorbonne because she had no choice. I understand. Yeah. Go ahead. I want to understand. Now about the publishing, if I go about the uh, why she couldn't complete uh, her initial doctoral work at Columbia. Uh, some research suggests um, that, well, her familial um, presence, but she didn't have any biological children. Um, but much of her work through education um, would be analogous in some ways to like, I don't want to overstretch it, but social work. If you took in uh, family members, children, things of that nature, from, from the sort of work on. Um, but the, also the connection with um, Paris is that um, a, a, a French um, Scholar who was essentially um, in DC, like evaluating uh, Dunbar of the uh, so forth, uh, M Street School, and 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 notice her prowess mm -hmm. as an uh, administrator and as an educator. Mm -hmm. um, from what I found, that's how she was. And so she was able to transfer. He helped her to negotiate some of how to transfer her credits and things that nature. Well, what I know about the, the history of printing. Right in the U.S. Um, when you look when you look at the African diaspora, right, the, the, um, if you think about the, the quality of the works in the U.S., it's so much worse in Latin America because uh, printing comes later in, in particular places like Brazil, uh, and then it's very elite, concentrated around a few people. Whereas the U.S., since the colonial period, had a strong tradition of printing through subscription. Right, so people who are a member of um, literary societies or discussion 
groups or well, well, well connected could generate a subscription list, meaning people who would be willing to buy their book if it were published and take that to a publisher. Um, and that would guarantee at least, you know, uh, compensating for the cost of printing that work. Um, so there was a lot of printing done that way. Uh, and then there were uh, right associations that were actively trying to promote certain types of literature. So the abolitionist societies were very active uh, in uh, sponsoring right publications of work like Harry, Jacob, and, and others. Um, and there were some, I don't know if these essays were for, first came out in newspapers, but sometimes, right, there were also, uh, you know, essays printed in literary magazines or newspapers that were then, once there was like a, a demand for that author, then uh, a, a press, a printing house, which would be for this book, right, would be interested in, in publishing it as well. So, there had there had to be some um, activism in a way, right, yeah. of, of getting uh, these works uh, out and using these connections uh, to publish his work. But um, but it is it is kind of impressive how much printed work was produced in the United States in the 19th century. If you compare to other parts of the Americas or even to Europe, uh, because uh, there were printing presses. Most most big cities had a printing press. People who ran newspapers were interested in publishing pamphlets or essays or something that would also sponsor their printing. We had the North American Review, and we had William Dean Howells of Atlantic Monthly, which is during this period of time. Yeah. But Mary, do you know? You just bought the book edition. No, that's a great question. I don't. I don't exactly know the answer. One thing that you'll see if you um, go over and look at the books is. Um, some of the same publishers repeated. Um, something else that you'll see a couple of times is published for the author, which means, again, there was some sort of funding that was created that made it possible for this to happen. Phyllis Wheatley, which is the earliest, of course, 1773, she did have to go to London to get her book published. Once it was out, um, it was very popular in the United States as well as in um, Britain, but she did have, she could not find a publisher in America. Um, and some of her work was first published in certainly in journals, The Gentleman's uh, Monthly, um, and a couple of others. So I think it's a combination of all those factors, but it's a great question. Um, and a, a sort of a study of, of that history would be, would be fascinating. And we switch back to your microphone so Dr. Gibbs Gray can answer as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, Dr. Gibbs Gray, sorry, did you have any thoughts on if you heard the question about how, um, yes. how these were published at the time? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Um, hold on, hold on. We're not hearing you. Whoops. The subscriptions yeah. were kind of like the original Kickstarters, right? Yeah. You could look at yeah. it that way. Yeah. Okay. Serialized. We have your sound now. Go ahead, yeah. please. Okay, um, perfect. So in, in addition to what each of you also thoughtfully said, when I think back to the early writings of Frances Harper, that her first few writings, which were short stories and poems, so remember that during this time, um, slavery was still very much ingrained in our society. So many of her early poems and short stories were actually published in abolitionist newspapers, including The Liberator. So if we remember Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison um, had uh, began abolitionist based newspapers. And this was a platform, an early platform for her, where later on, when many of her poems and short stories were, were included into text, they first started in these anti-slavery uh, abolitionist newspapers. Thank you. Um, and um, Dr. Atlas just wanted me to add the, um, the imprint information for um, Cooper's book, which is um, that it was published in Xenia, Xenia? I don't know, Ohio? Okay, um, by the Aldine Printing House in 1892. And again, the Aldine Printing House will come up again if you go over um, and look at the books. Hey, Mir. Yes. No, I just wanted to add to that from when I was looking at all these, I was so, I, I mean, I guess I should have known this, but a lot of uh, these women did have their owners, I hate using that word, but recognize their 
their smarts, recognize their talent and their creativity. So I think part of it is that they're just support. I wouldn't say there was a lot of it, but definitely I uh, forget it. The Wheatley. Wheatley. I mean, they they loved her stuff and promoted her. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, one more question. I don't see anything in the chat. I just want to say Ann Bradstreet, when she wrote um, and her allegedly her brother-in-law stole her poetry and got it published in England. One of her poems, the prologue, says it's very sarcastic, beautifully written, so much fun, anthologized all over the place, easy to get. She said, read me. And what Cooper adds to that is listen to my voice. You know, that's so important. Don't tell me who I am. Listen to who I say I am. I know better than you who I am. Read me, listen to me in my voice. And even her title, she says it twice. A voice from the South by a black woman of the South. I know what I'm talking about. Read me, listen to me. And that, I think that's a recurrent thing for minorities. Like, don't tell me who I am. Leave me alone. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I do want people to have time to look at the books. Um, so just a few kind of final things um, really quick. Um, I've lost my page. Give me a second. Um, I do have a um, link that I'm going to put in the chat and a QR code that I'm going to put up for those of you in the room um, to some additional resources. Um, and also, if you are online, um, this will get you to images of some of the books. And again, for those of you in the room, it will allow you to go back to these books, find the catalog records, spend more time with them. Um, Lorraine created a great list of additional primary source resources in some of the library's databases. Um, so if you want to take a moment to capture this, um, and then, yeah, please feel free to head over by the windows. And um, the books are organized chronologically. Um, starting with Wheatley on the right here in 1773 and moving forward to almost the present day where I did bring in a few artist books by um, black creators who are currently um, really talking about some of the same things that these women were talking about in the 18th and 19th century um, and expressing their identities through their art and their words, um, their philosophies and their thinkings. Um, so, um, Thank you again so much to everyone. There is also a survey in the back of the room. Um, if you don't mind filling that out on your way back out, we really appreciate it. Um, thank you all for your time and participation. One more round of applause. Yeah. Thank you. And for those of you yeah. on Teams, I am putting. I put them both in the chat. Oh, you did it. Okay. Oh. I wonder why I just didn't have this stuff. Okay, right. 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 Dr. Gibbs, it's great. Thank you so much again. I really appreciate you coming. Um, I do have questions for you, but I want to give people time for the books. So, okay, uh, perfect. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, hopefully, you can have a follow up conversation someday when you're back in Athens or by email. Um, but thank you. Thank you.